Happy Dennis here on 1FM 91.3. Good times, greatest hits. Good morning to you. Welcome to The Bright Side. Well, as mentioned earlier, we are going to do a series this week on uh, autism, special needs, intellectual disabilities. And to uh, take us through all of that, we've got Dr. Natasha Riyad. She's a clinical psychologist with over 10 years experience and specializes in early childhood development, child and parent mental health and parenting. Uh, Dr. Natasha is also the clinical manager at the James Cook University Singapore Psychology Clinic, and she also has her own private practice. You may remember that we also had her back in September joining us. Dr. Natasha, so good to have you join us again. Yeah, welcome back. I'm happy to be back. So let's get straight into it because this is a a huge, huge topic. Um, What are some of the early indicators for a parent if they feel there's something a little out of the ordinary with their child? What should they be looking out for? Mm. I actually, there's a very handy thing that all parents get once their child's born, and that's the health booklet. Okay. So I know it's something that we kind of toss aside, <laughs> um, but it's a very important book to look at, mm-hmm. not just for their medical needs and their vaccinations, um, but it has all those developmental milestones. So that is actually the first thing I would recommend. Okay. That take that kind of seriously, open it. You know, there's four to eight weeks, there's some kind yeah. of screening and, and all the months and all that. So it has language, uh, personal social skills, gross motor, fine motor. So those are things that are very important. I will admit I get a little bit competitive. So I look at the health book and they're like, can my child do this? Of course he can. But it's like, you know, a five-year-old, I'm like, no, no, he can. Come, son. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So... So it's something to kind of look at And what's nice is that it's There's a range, right? So it's like, let's say, four to eight weeks And then like, I don't know, 15 to 18 months or something But it's something that you need to check And you get reminded mm. Because when you go for those vaccinations It's a reminder for you to kind of open and look at it Something I think I would like to say is that It's it's sort of conservative, actually I think sometimes parents go in and think that Oh no, these are like A-star Or like go, like my child can do it Then <laughs> like it's, it's very good already But it's actually quite conservative if you look at it So take it quite seriously Because it's really like baseline They're ah. looking for you to just meet that baseline mm. So if they're not meeting it Then it's something for you to sort of like wanna okay ca- catch on, right. so it's not like oh my child can can do this. It's still okay, you know. So look at what it is that the item is, and then look at there'll be one where it's like ninety percent of children can do this by a certain age. Mm. So that's a lot of children yes. who can do it by that age. And so not hitting that. Yeah, so it's a very conservative thing. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, if I may just relate, um, I, I didn't really look at the booklet a lot. I I will just uh, put my hand up. Um, But it it was on a holiday where we we saw our three-year-old who was already not speaking much. And that is obviously um, one of the the indicators, right? Um, Just was really behaving, uh, obviously, in a new environment outside of the home. We were away on holiday for nine days. The behavior was certainly um, very intense, um, putting it very kindly. And it was out of the ordinary. Mm -hmm. Something just sparked us. Um, what was the one thing that actually? The made one you thing kind of was we were in our hotel room uh, in the evening after a great day out, and uh, there's a balcony with our attached to our room, and he was just out on the balcony. It was, it was, there's a b- high barrier and stuff, so we weren't worried. But he decided he thought we were on the third floor. He decided right at the bottom of the balcony there was a little gap. Mm. He decided th- he might lower himself or try to lower himself through that so all he could do was fit his legs through the, the the little space at the bottom balcony and he went hey mama papa bye like that oh lord and i was like ah so obviously there's no way he could have gotten out but mm. he thought it was fun just to dangle his legs out from the bottom of the balcony now that is a lack of uh, awareness of danger is definitely you know that night we we really panicked and we started googling which is also not a very good thing to do because and so I'm sure Dr. Natasha will tell you. <laughs> Dr. Google. Right. I was like, oh my goodness, you know, he's got this, that, around. But it, it just kind of already, for us, it kind of told us something's not quite right. Mm-hmm. Um, a little of the out, out of the ordinary. So mm-hmm. that's where we uh, decided to take action. Yeah, I think it could be anything. I think mostly when they when children come in and parents are concerned, it's usually about language. Yes. It'll be like the first thing they will notice mm-hmm. that their child's not talking. Yes. And tantrums Right So it's sort of like Very unexplainable Like we have no idea Why he's crying all the time And getting kind of 
you know, angry about certain things and it seems way out compared mm. to maybe other children we had or other children that we know. Correct. So I feel like those are the two big things that that bring children in. It's hard to define sometimes because kids have tantrums a lot, yes. don't they? Um, <laughs> and, you know, we we had an elder brother, uh, mm. uh, our elder son, sorry, um, to kind of use that as a, as a comparison. So that mm. was that was uh, a good way for us to make that that um, kind of a diagnosis on our own. Mm. All right. We are learning so much this morning already with Dr. Natasha Riyad and our special series happens this week on autism. If you have any questions, do drop them via WhatsApp 88550913. We're also live on Facebook. You can comment. Leave us your questions there as well at facebook.com slash 1FM913. The conversation continues online and back with more with Dr. Natasha in just a bit. Good. Hey, very good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us here on our Facebook Live. Once again, good morning to Alun, always tuning in. Buddy, how are you doing this Monday morning? And remember, everyone, if you're chiming in, it could be a comment, could be a question, it might just win you a 60-minute O2 bubble facial that's worth $320, all thanks to Spa Rael. All right, so Dr. Natasha, when should parents actually seek professional help regarding their child? You know, quite often they'll tend to dismiss it as kids being kids. Right. Like Shazad mentioned, you know, um... Or they'll grow, uh, you know, out of the issue. In fact, as you're talking about that, I'm like, don't some kids actually do that? Don't they kind of like test the boundaries a little bit? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's because of that, probably the language as well. Yeah. Plus, you're seeing something like that. And then that, you know, it can, anything can prompt a parent to go. Mm. Um, I think if you're following up with those developmental checks um, and you're visiting the polyclinic, I feel like those doctors would pick up on those things mm-hmm. so that is I think an indicator I think if someone sort of bringing up and saying that hey these developmental milestones are important and I see that your child might not be meeting them I think they would kind of already refer you to you know either KKH or um, NUH for example for further mm-hmm. checkups the thing I want to point out is with being specific to autism you might not catch that mm-hmm. off of the health booklet mm-hmm. if your child is not delayed because children on uh, with autism or autistic children, they are on a spectrum mm-hmm. with different kinds of intellectual abilities. Right. Mm-hmm. So what I would suggest is that if let's say autism is on your mind for whatever reason, you know, mm-hmm. if you're looking at your child for whatever reason, you just think there's a very good app out there. It's called AS Detect. And the difference between that and let's say a health booklet is that it, it straight away goes into... Um, Autism, And when I'm talking about that, I mean like they're looking at things like eye contact, pointing, gestures, imitation, you know, response to name, following, pointing. Like these are the th- very specific things we want to look okay. at okay. that might not be picked up like on a health booklet. Because oh. a health booklet is more general, right? Mm-hmm. You're looking at does a child have global developmental delay? Yes. Meaning like they have, le- uh, you know, delays in two areas, like maybe fine motor and then language or learning. Mm-hmm. But for autism, it's quite specific to social interaction and social communication. Mm. So that's like the key thing. And then on top of that, they may have, um, well, if they are autistic, then they will have certain kinds of like maybe repetitive behaviors and interests and sensory things just want to ask so how does this you know the actual diagnosis process actually work you know what are the steps involved what does it entail how is it done Mm. okay so i think if you go through like the polyclinic and you go and see it the first person kind of you'll see is that uh, a medical doctor or pediatrician Mm -hmm. and then they will do some kind of more i would say global look they just kind of will look at those same things that the health booklet will look at Mm -hmm. but um, more specifically so they kind of want to pick up, is there a delay first? And then there'll be certain kinds of of things that they're observing, right? Like we would sort of be quite close to looking at how's the eye contact or um, how's like the interaction, their interest in other people. Mm. So those are things that like we'll pick up. It is kind of like um, a process itself because then the pediatrician would then refer you to a speech and language therapist or an occupational therapist or a psychologist. So it's a... It's hard to say like how specifically it would go, mm-hmm. but there will be this process if you go through that route. Mm-hmm. And it's a good process in the sense that everybody's making observations. Right. So whoever you meet, they'll be interacting with the child and making all of these things and all these things will be known to each other and the pediatrician so that we're collecting all this data that will help us to see whether a diagnosis is, whether we're headed in that direction. I think, you know, um, once that, 
diagnosis is done and then you start going to uh, therapists and all that. Like in, in, in my example with my son, uh, he went to speech therapy because as I said, he, he wasn't speaking uh, much at all or, or it wasn't, it was kind of gobbledygook. It wasn't, it wasn't, um, it wasn't coming out the way mm -hmm. you would expect it to. But the, as soon as the therapy started, actually the, it, it changed quite dramatically for us. I think in, in that sense, we, we were so relieved um, and that was a, a delay. He had a speech delay as well. So may maybe you can just explain to us the, sort of the difference between delays and, and, and other, other issues that might crop up. Sorry, perhaps we'll jump on air for that, uh, to further that discussion uh, in just a little bit, okay? Uh, we are live with Dr. Natasha Riyad. If you have any questions on the topic, remember you can send them over via the comment section on our Facebook or WhatsApp us, 88550913. Hope you enjoyed that one. Cutting crew, I just died in your arms. A very good morning to you and welcome to The Bright Side. This morning, we're chatting with Dr. Natasha Riyad, and she's a clinical psychologist with over 10 years of experience. She specializes in early childhood, child and parent mental health and parenting. And she's in for our very special series this week on autism. And earlier on, we we're talking about, you know, the process of diagnosis. And Shazad, you speak from experience as well this morning. Yes. Um, because you have a child mm -hmm. who is, uh, you know. On the spectrum. Yeah. yeah. And what are some of the differences between diagnosis and delays, Dr. Mm. Natasha? Yeah. So delays... Um, can be short term, can be long term, can be permanent. So sometimes they're just biological. That means that, you know, your child's already born that way. The brain is kind of shaped in a certain way mm -hmm. and you know it's going to be maybe a permanent thing. Well, I say you know, but we don't really know until later down the road. Sure. So um, delays, typically, you're going to sort of like go for intervention and, you know, you have that individualized plan um, and then you're kind of, Going through that process and waiting till about five or six, I would say seven, like the latest, but about five or six mm -hmm. delays, then if they're still there, then fall into kind of more of a disorder. Because especially if you're working with it very long term, like since young, mm -hmm. but when they're caught later, like you have a child that's like five or six, right. I think... We'll start off with intervention first, just to see how things go. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's hard to, it's, I think it's harder to say once they're a bit older. But I guess what I'm talking about is that that delay is that time when you catch them at quite early. And then about five to six, you really want to be seeing some improvements through intervention by then. So and this could be on anything like language, uh, psychomotor. Exactly. Okay. So it can be biological or it can be exposure. So, for example, lack of exposure can make things that mm. are actually not biologically a, like a true delay mm. be delayed. Yeah, okay. I think um, lots of things, I think especially in Singapore, I think the physios and the OTs want to bring it up is that people don't put their children on the floor anymore. Mm. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's like a lack of tummy time, children aren't like crawling. Um, I think especially if uh, during oh. covid Playgrounds were closed, so you're looking at some gross motor delays probably because children are not really like climbing up, yeah. sliding down, doing all of those things. So, so that's kind of circumstantial, like situational because of COVID. Yeah, or right. just like lack of exposure because, you know, um, maybe just different kinds of families, what they might focus on, um, at risk, like if... You know, for example, maybe single parents, low income, they have lots of other things that they really need to attend to because physical health and just taking care of the family mm -hmm. is so important that maybe certain things are might be overlooked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there is that like true delay biological where by the time it's like five, six, seven, you know, it's time to get them formally assessed okay. in terms of schooling. And then there's the kind where, you know, for example, like Shazad mentioned, where they start intervention and you can just see with your own eyes mm. that a specialized kind of thing really works. And um, I think intervention is definitely the way to go and parent involvement because mm. most of the time you're there with them every day and, and at an early age, they need that frequency. 
Mm. That could come from the parents. Actually, when you speak of uh, early intervention here, because we've got a question from Will, um, he says, you know, is there any way, any signs to look out for to sort of prevent autism? It's not about preventing autism, you would say, mm. right? It's more about getting in there with the early intervention. Is that correct way of looking at it? Yes. So autism is one of those things that even till today, this is multifactorial. There's no like one thing that like causes autism. Mm. I think mm-hmm. it's safe to say that children are, are born yeah. with autism and then you're sort of seeing symptoms play out okay. much later. So there's nothing you can do to prevent. And I think I kind of want to put it out there as well that we're not trying to make children normal. Mm. Like we're not sort of saying, oh, with intervention, we want them to be just like their peers. Mm. I think the focus should be on their functional needs. Like yeah. what mm. do you need? Mm. There's lots of things and lots of Symptoms and behaviours Related to autism That you don't have to change mm. Like why do you have to change The fact that they like one thing And they like it a lot mm. Unless it's kind of Preventing them Maybe from learning The things that you know That they would need To sort of Like develop other skills Of independence yeah. So Just make sure that You know when you're looking At that child It's not like Okay my desire Is to make you Normal and typical And be like everyone else Because I don't. I mean, I personally don't think it should be. I think that's why those individualized plans are so important. You're looking at the child and going, actually, what does he need? Is it that he needs to 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 sit down a bit more and maybe start using the pencil, or mm. you know, does he need like what is it that basic functions, right? Yes, like yeah. to focus on those. I think that's a really beautiful thought, you know, it's about accepting who they are. I mean, they are individuals as well. It's not about changing them or making them normal. I mean, what is normal, right? Mm. Uh, we've got some really great questions from uh, those chi- uh, listening in on our Facebook Live. So we're going to head on over and share those questions with you as well. Come and join us. Natasha. Because we're trying to focus on what they need, right? How does this kind of change when they go to school? I know like um, a lot of the kids who are on the spectrum actually enter regular school and they're in regular classrooms. Uh, and I and I do feel that sometimes the teachers or the, maybe the system is such that it's all very mass. It's all catered to the mm-hmm. numbers, you know, and the groups. And how, how can we better support them in that environment? And, you know, what are some of the challenges just that kids actually do face in that kind of environment? I think the biggest challenge that autistic children face is lack of knowledge from the people around them. Mm. So that's why I think there's this idea of like label with care Mm. because you, you know, I think especially if we're not knowledgeable, we'll we'll just like, you know, to almost like the civilian or like the naked eye Mm. is just naughty, like not paying attention. Um, all those other labels that we don't want. Mm. So I think the moment you find out that you have a, a, a person that you know, whoever that is, the child in your classroom, whoever, like get knowledgeable. Like go online and learn as much as you can. But also look at the person in front of you because they're not all alike. You know, children with autism are just like all of us. We have different personalities, yeah. different interests, different things. So, yes, get knowledgeable about autism, but also view this person as like a unique individual. So, there's certain things that I think teachers or just, um, I, I don't know what's the word, but like maybe non, non-allied non uh, professionals might not catch. Yes. So, for example, like a child could be seen as like throwing a tantrum and they could be like you know hiding under the mm-hmm. the, the table and they don't want to do their piece of work and you could just label them as like you're being defiant yeah. you're not following the class because the expectation is for them to fall in line yes right so that's why that knowledge from the parents or knowledge mm-hmm. of like I want to know this child better is it sensory mm. is it that suddenly we talked about a topic that they're not comfortable with was it right. like the alarm was yeah. it this bell, you know, what, what is the thing that's mm. getting in the way? And if you can find out what it is, then you you are coming at it more like, I want to support you, accommodate you so that you can learn. Because without taking care of their, well, physical health and also their socio-emotional needs, right, you can't teach them. Like, we don't learn when we're anxious. We're le- we learn when we're comfortable. Mm. So I think if we come at it from that perspective, the first thing, I, I can't help but bring in co-regulation But <laughs> you really need to understand mm. That person in front of you Like what is it that's getting in the way And, and focus on that mm. Yeah 
We've got some really great chime-ins this morning. I think this on, this whole uh, topic about autism mm. is really of great interest to our listeners as well. Shireen actually says, you know, good morning, Dr. Natasha. Um, she chimed in about how you're right. You know, she feels that her eldest granddaughter during COVID, because of what you pointed out, you know, oh. um, she was not speaking clearly or correctly for a while because all the teachers were masked up. And, you know, the kids didn't have like that, yeah. you know. This was a big issue. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And she wanted to ask this. Um, she says... We'll appreciate very much if you can tell us how to differentiate between autism and ADHD because to her, sometimes the symptoms kind of look alike. We also have a chime in from Hannah. Um, she mentions about how, you know, is it asking about is uh, autism hereditary because the parents have no such condition and uh, is it to do with diet, you know, and are there any special diet for such autistic kids? Interesting mm. questions. <laughs> uh, yeah, very interesting. I think it's hard to ex- to go into such detail about the difference between autism and ADHD. So all I can say is that they are very, what we call, highly comorbid. So it means that they tend to go together. Yep. And I think sometimes when parents come in and they're thinking ADHD, uh, professionals do have to also look at whether well, it's autism. autism. Yeah. So I think that's a whole other special. Yeah. So I think that's all I can say on that one. Um, about the diet one, um, I again, I think like that's not the main concern. I think if your child has other things related to medical and diet issues, you can have a talk with a medical professional about that. But I think when it comes to intervention, you're, you're really looking at those core developmental things like the language, the personal social, the yeah. cognitive, yeah. The, the problem solving, and then the gross and fine motor. Yeah. Mm. Okay. We're about to head back live on air as well. Uh, we got a question from Gurmit. Is, yeah. Who's? It's a very straightforward question. I think pr- probably best to clarify that before we move forward. Okay. Yes. Hang tight. That's the Buggles with the radio killed. Uh, sorry, <laughs> video killed the radio star. I'm um, this radio star's in trouble. <laughs> Right well, now. you know, if radio kills a radio star, then I think we should just we be should stars. just go home just now. Stars. Just go home now. Quick yeah. while we're ahead, you know. <laughs> Listen, we are doing this uh, special at the moment on uh, autism here with Dr. Natasha Riyad. Um, it's obviously striking a chord uh, with many of you out there. Um, and please do keep your questions and comments coming in. Gurmit is asking the question, and, and this is something actually we were, were also going to pose to you, Dr. Natasha, is what is the spectrum? Uh, because I think as it's important to remember... It's, there is no one standard for autism. And maybe you can explain what that spectrum is all about. Okay. So when we look at autism, if you're looking at it diagnostically, the things that we're kind of looking out for. So I think this ties into what I wanted to add on as well, is that the process of diagnosis is that, that process that I talked about earlier. But when you finally get into the door of a psychologist who's doing the actual diagnosis, we are interviewing the parents and get and we are also doing something, a standardized assessment with the child. And we're looking at two very big things. The first one is the social interaction and social communication. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at like back and forth conversation, interest in other children, like non-verbal, like gestures. We're looking at all those things. That's the heart of it. Okay. And then the second part, we're looking at those repetitive uh, any repetitive behaviours, interests, sensory um, things, uh, compulsions, rituals, like more behavioural. So those are the two big things and that's what we like solely focus on. So when we look at the spectrum, we really mean that their behaviours can look different but like associated with those two things. So it means for some children, they have like zero sensory issues for, for, mm. for whatever reason. Yeah. And then some have a lot, very high. So that's that spectrum we're looking at, that it can be, the intensity can be different. The behavior itself can be different. And then also their intellectual ability. So that's the other, like, after we secure those two things, we're then looking what's at, what is accompanying. Right. Is there language issues accompanying? Because not all children... Um, with autism mm. have language issues yeah. some of them in fact are so wow they're so well spoken w- and well read exactly yeah yeah and so i think those are the ones that uh they they get diagnosed much later mm. like nine or ten mm. because you know all those things that i talked about you won't see them like the eye contact yes. like the pointing all those things that i mentioned they'll be there. like i can't tell the difference right. they're, they're 
and 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 maybe um, expand them because you, you quite often hear uh, the the phrases low functioning and and high functioning mm. within the spectrum. Maybe yeah. you can expand on that. Okay, so I think I personally not a fan of those mm. terms because you can be a mainstream child mm. and then be called like high functioning, right? But in some sense, some parents are like. Are they really high functioning? No, they that within that mainstream, they are struggling so much more than their peers. Yeah. Um, so I don't really like that term. That, that labeling that labeling can be quite limiting, can't it? Yes. So um, I think when we talk about that, we're actually looking more at intellectual abilities. Uh, 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 when you're talking about the functioning part. Yes. When yeah. I'm talking about the functioning, it's because you're looking at essentially if you if your child has an intellectual disability accompanying the autism then that's when their needs are more so i think one way to like think about the needs is when you look at your child or any one of us does that can this child independently learn in a you know one is to 30 or one mm. is to 40 ratio mm. and like follow that mm-hmm. and sort of do you know like have all those skills that would help you with that mm. Or Would they need One is to twelve One is to ten One is to four mm. So The higher Sort of Like their needs That means like They need a much smaller classroom And they need more of that Small group Or one to one care I think that's what uh, I'm looking at When you're talking about Functioning mm. Like how much mm. Support do you need mm. So I think Yes it, Once you get to that mainstream It kind of means that Like oh maybe you need Lesser support Compared to a child Maybe with intellectual disability And autism That needs Much more help But then once you get to mainstream as a whole It's a whole different ball game mm. Because you And then the rest of the kids And then the teachers And the school environment You could be needing A lot of help mm. We're, we're going to be talking about Actually with Dr. Natasha In a couple of days time On education Yeah And, and um, primary school and, and, and beyond So we'll, we'll We'll keep that one on ice for now, um, but w- for today, our main sort of focus is on the early stages, the diagnosis, and also on um, early intervention. Yeah. All right. So, Dr. Natasha, thank you so much for joining us here in the studio today. Uh, our conversation will continue on Facebook Live, so do join us there, facebook.com slash 1FM913. Um, so, Dr. Natasha, we've got a quick question on early intervention. Just how much of a difference can early intervention make? Mm. All the difference in the world. Mm. <laughs> I cannot yeah. overstate yes. it enough. Intervention. And when I say intervention, yes, of course, I mean going to see a professional and doing that. But really, to me, because I work a lot of par- with parents and my, my thing is like zero to six, right? Mm-hmm. Is the parents. Yeah. Intervention at home. Whatever that you can pick up from what the professional is telling you, whatever you can read up, whatever that you know, start doing it. Mm-hmm. Because it, 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 when you look at intervention, right, it's not actually something like, I wouldn't say it's like mind-boggling, like something new that we don't know about. Mm-hmm. I bet like if you set in on that, and it's speech and language therapy, for example. It's about maybe finding a keyword or how to use that particular word many times, um, how to start using it in conversation, how to like prompt your child, yeah. how to create those opportunities. So that's the difference where if you have, let's say, a neurotypical child, they will just come to you and just start talking. They are the ones who create all those opportunities, right? Yes. Mm. But for autistic children, they may not create those opportunities on their own. You have to be, uh. you have to create it. Mm. You have to prompt them, start a conversation, pointing things out, finding out, hey, what do you like? Like, if you like Legos, great. How do I use Legos to maybe start even getting you interested in like feeding yourself or uh, in you know talking about conversation, so right. I don't feel like pretend play means like everybody has to play with like figurines and dolls. Like you have autistic children who love Legos and they can do lots of pretend exactly. play with that. Yes. But so we don't want to be like no no you can't play Legos. Please play like what the neurotypical kids are doing. Right. Like no don't do that. Follow their lead. Follow their interests and build on that. You need to interact with them every day. Agreed. Dr. Natasha, I mean, they also said that, you know, early intervention is also important because the mind is really a mystery, right? And there is a great chance that the brain can actually be reshaped, you know, neural connections can be made as well. So getting in there early is important. I have this great question from Juan Alu and he says, how should friends of parents of those with autistic children behave? Actually, that's a great question, Mm. especially when the diagnosis has been positive. Uh, Yeah, I think... 
being th- I think this is something we're going to cover in depth tomorrow sure. so yeah. do join us for that but I think just a simple answer would be be a good listener right. just listen to whatever it is that they have to say and and that's what they need I think at first I just want to very quickly add before we wrap up today's episode, and I know we could go on about this for a long time. <laughs> yeah, is I cannot stress um, as a parent of uh, of a child on the spectrum how crucial it was to intervene. Um, and and the intervention I, I also want to add is not just from the the professional's point of view. The parents mm-hmm. do not dismiss what you might think is just are oh, their kids being kids. I think we we kind of talked about that earlier. I, I'm so pleased for ourselves that we decided to take action when we did, when he was only three, my son was only three, we felt something wasn't quite uh, ordinary and the intervention that we took has really, really helped him to where, to, to where he is now, to help him to push him to a level that we find that he can do the basic functions, as you said, to, uh, so much better than where he was at three years old. So I cannot stress enough, the early intervention has to also come from parents and don't dismiss what you might think is just kids being kids. Mm. Um, wh- what are the options for early intervention? Mm. So I think usually, again, you would go through that whole polyclinic route and you end up in some doctor's um, office and um, they're noticing certain delays. So there are lots of options. There's public and private. Yeah. So there's like the early intervention program for infants and children. So that is like the big one, the national one. Mm-hmm. It's called EPIC. Epic yeah. yeah. And then there's also... Um, kind of like half-half, like private ser- service providers who are also providing um, EPIC before maybe kids transfer to EPIC. And then, of course, there's private as well. So there's also um, like specialised where you have like, I see a speech and language therapist and I'm working on speech and language. I see an occupational therapist and I'm working on those daily living skills and, and stuff. Or I see a physio, gross motor, fine, uh, wait, fine motors by OT. Sorry about that, OTs. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> and also more like where it's holistic so it doesn't have to be specialized because development is so global you know you're not just picking one thing you're working on everything, everything. Mm. yeah Dr. Natasha, thank you so much again for sharing with us your wisdom and your knowledge on this topic. Uh, tomorrow, you'll be back to join us and we'll be delving into parent involvement and how uh, we can support parents who mm-hmm. are uh, with kids with autism or on the spectrum. And uh, we look forward to that chat. And if you've been joining us here on Facebook this morning, thank you so much for your questions. Keep them coming through for Dr. Natasha, who will be in this week on the 7th and the 8th of November as well. Okay, we want to help you in any way possible. Uh, once again, you can WhatsApp us, 885 three or send us your comments uh dr natasha we look forward to welcoming you back tomorrow thank you so much thank you good time greatest hit